I had the pleasure to intern with Scott uh, last summer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, so I'm really glad to be able to introduce him. Um, so Scott uh, Davidoff leads the design and development of uh, human interfaces for mission operations at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, he investigates how data visualization and virtual reality impact space exploration and telerobotics. Um, at NASA, um, he's a principal investigator for space networking and mission automation program and a project lead for the human robotic systems program. Formerly, he, was, uh, he got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon University where he introduced lightweight prototyping methods that have become industry standard uh, software practice. Um, I had the pleasure to intern with him. I think he likes Dub a little bit because he had interns from Dub. People ended up at Dub after interning with him. He has full-time staff from Dub, so yeah. um, I hope he will enjoy his stay here. Uh, today he will be talking about how um, data visualization has the impact, the potential to change um, how we conduct science. He will be presenting a couple of projects developed at the NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Lab and um, to visualize fluid dynamics um, and massive networks and terrain. And he will talk about how these drive new capabilities in computational science. I had the pleasure to see some of these projects being developed and yeah. it's been really exciting to be able to be part of that lab. So, Scott. Thanks. I think Elena is being a little humble. She has the, actually was able to collaborate on a, some of the work that I'll be able to show. Um, so, uh, how are we doing on microphone? Can everyone hear? Okay, good. Um, so, I, I, I'm very excited to be able to talk about the work that I've been doing at the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab uh, over the last two years. Um, let me just briefly go over uh, for the, what the goals of the lab are um, and how I think the computing is, you know, has the potential to impact that work. So uh, I think like many people here um, at a, you know, a rich university like this, uh, the goal of the Jet Propulsion Lab is to create new knowledge about the universe. And our work is very focused on physical science. And so um, we, there are two main areas of study. One is the Earth and other planetary bodies. Uh, and the other is the universe itself, which I guess contains Earth as well. But, um, and probably most notable of the work that the Jet Propulsion Lab does is that we have really cool toys that we get to work with. Um, and I think one thing to, that I have to often remind roboticists at JPL is that while this is a robot, actually for scientists, this is the world's most expensive telescope. And that's actually how they think about it. Because what, they're, what we're doing is placing a camera on another planet and taking photographs and conducting science. Now, JPL is a very interesting combination. Um, culturally speaking, it includes some of the most incredibly advanced things that I have ever had the privilege of working on. And also, in many ways, there's a lot of cultural drag in terms of their adoption of new uh, scientific practice, particularly in computer science. I think a lot of this comes from the heritage of the aerospace industry, where the, effectively the waterfall method of developing uh, you know, massive computing systems, this is really where it came from. And if you could imagine, um, think about this as a disincentive for change. You send a $2 billion rover to another planet and it lands there. Do you want to be the person who says, I think we should try something different? Um, you know, th there's a significant amount of risk involved in bringing in new ways of thinking about problems. So there's an interesting balance at the lab between, uh, you know, an openness to change, an excitement to change, and an unwillingness to change. So part of what I consider my job to be is to bring the discipline of human-computer interaction to the Jet Propulsion Lab. 
And I'm now two years into the practice. And what I would like to show today are a number of projects that we have underway. Uh, principally, I'm going to focus on how we're using virtual reality and information visualization to effectively support the JPL mission, right, which is the scientific discovery. Um, I will make a few arguments, some more supported than others. And uh, the ones that are not supported, I'm hoping that will produce the evidence. Um, so in some ways, this is slightly a preliminary talk, but I'm hoping to get people excited to come, excited enough to want to come in and join the support of the, what I see as the most exciting mission possible, which is making discoveries about the universe. So I think the first is one that, the, the first uh, supposition is one that I think research and visualization will strongly support. And that's that visualization streamlines scientific discovery. Um, it takes a lot of the processes that otherwise might take a very long time and enables them to just happen faster. Now it's important because it essentially enables more science. However, and I think the possibly harder and slightly longer term uh, hypothesis that I'd like to make is that visualization actually has the potential to change the way that we do science. Um, I had a wonderful conversation with, with Jeff here today where he uh, described some work that he and his staff are, are, are conducting that's taking steps in the direction of, uh, of you know, providing evidence to support hypotheses like that. So uh, if you're excited about this kind of thing, please go talk to him and of course Cecilia who you have here doing work in this area as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of different domains. So I'll show, talk about uh, visualization, oh, excuse me, uh, immersive visualization, um, operating robots, uh, fluid dynamics, uh, brain uh, and brain networks. But let me start with uh, the problem that we've gotten, gathered the most evidence in support of, and that's uh, immersive uh, virtual reality. So let me give you a little bit of background on how science gets done at, uh, at JPL, or at least scientific operations. So, uh, a lot of the work is about planetary geology, right? So one of the things to, that you need to understand in order to figure out where life came from when you look at a planet like Mars is to figure out where life might have originated or how the planet came to be in the way that it is. So there's actually a lot, there's more geologists than any other science at JPL. And so geologists study the world um, by going out into it. And these uh, hardy geologists with their little hammers that we've drawn here, um, you know, they rely very much on their senses in order to understand the world. Um, and of course, our senses are millions of years of evolution for helping us survive. Um, now, that the way that we perceive the world is actually uh, sort of runs counter to the way that we are forced to do scientific investigation on Mars, because. It's very hard, well, we, no, we can't be there, right? We've never put uh, boots on, on that planet. So basically everything happens through a computer. So the computer becomes the world that, that we have to investigate. So every piece of the picture that we have about this planet has happened basically by staring at a computer screen and uh, maybe in a more a slightly elaborate way by taping pictures to the wall. But really effectively the same thing. We don't have a real ground truth. In fact, the way that scientists prefer to build an understanding of the actual environment is by stitching together panoramas. Um, now there's something very interesting about one of the trade-offs that scientists, um, I'd say, unwill unwittingly make here. Um, and that's that a panorama feels most like our own, the way that we perceive the world. However, it introduces significant distortion that we may simply not be aware of. So let me show you. One of the things that's hard to see here in a panorama that we've made like this is that this spot here is actually physically connected to this spot here in the picture. So when you're trying to imagine what the world looks like, this is actually pretty close to this and you have to re, you're effectively doing a kind of, a, a photographic algebra in your mind constantly to reorient yourself. 
Now what I've seen, why is that important? Well, because the way that scientists decide what they want to investigate depends on what they think is happening. And if they're all looking at uh, Mars and having to do some kind of mental calculation in their mind to really figure out what it looks like, then you have basically different individuals who are having a discussion about what might not actually be the same thing. And so um, I decided to m make this point to scientists and they politely declined. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided to make the point more forcefully. And perhaps this is uh, a, a lesson for those starting in industry. It's not always the best idea to take uh, your first project with people you're about to work with and make it disproving what they believe. <laughs> <laughs> However, when what they believe is inherently wrong, I'll leave it up to you. We chose to conduct a study where what we really wanted to do is demonstrate the value of being immersed in a virtual reality and an immersive model of Mars that we are demonstrating based on the different kinds of sensor data that we have on the rover that we can create. And I wanted to uh, make a proposal to the scientists that I bet that by being immersed in this other world that they'd be able to have a much better understanding of how things came to be in this world that they're in. So the experiment that we decided to conduct was to take actual Mars data and to place landmarks in the uh, environment and ask the scientists to draw a map. And we thought this map would be a good proxy for the, uh, their understanding of the situation. It's sort of hard to get good proxies for how people how accurate their understanding of a, of a particular place is. So this is the ground truth of the map that we asked, uh, or that we that we gave to scientists. Uh, we conducted a two by one between subjects study, uh, where one condition, the immersive condition, was able to look at this uh, this map and ask to draw a map uh, using a game controller that we gave them. Um, and, and place landmarks on the map. And the other group was asked to use the, this exact tool, which scientists use every day. So uh, this was the map. And I'll overlay it on a map that shows all the results. Uh, so these are each one of the points that all of the scientists uh, uh, indicated when they, when they chose to uh, demonstrate where the various uh, landmarks are. So um, let me explain just a little bit um, how, how to read this. So the X represents the true location of each of the different landmarks. The cluster of points represents the location that each of the scientists uh, chose. And, and we drew a bounding box around, the, I guess a bounding polygon. Uh, around each of the spots so that you get a sense of the sort of overall distribution. So um, like, what, what does one see when they look at this? So I think th the first thing that you see is that there's a much more, much tighter clusters around the actual location. So if this were like a shooting target, that this would, the person on the left would have scored much higher than the person on the right. Um, the other thing that I think you can see that really gets introduced by the way that scientists are currently trying to interact with the world is that if you look at the one on the, on the condition on the right, you'll see in some examples uh, like the orange one, there isn't actually, well, there's, a systemat there's no systematic bias to the right or to the left, or uh, there's in front, but, so nobody gets further, but people get thought it was in front of them or behind them. I mean, people just actually didn't have any uh, common ground on where these rocks were. Um, so I think the, the, the important takeaway for this is, is our scientific community who every day get together and decide what our robots should do on Mars based on what they think is happening don't see the same Mars and with the tools that they're using. Um, this is uh, excitingly enraging for them. Um, and then just for the scientific, to uh, provide a little bit more grounded evidence, we tried to, we did an analysis of the error here. We basically figured out, well, what are good 
estimates of the error, one, one estimate of the error would be angular error, so the, the, uh, the theta between where the, uh, the point is and the point that they suggested, so the ground truth. Uh, another would be distance, which is essentially the distance between where the actual landmark is and the scientist said it was. Um, uh, when you look at the results, we're on the order of, uh, uh, so just please be aware that the y axes are different in, in each of these two graphs. Um, but the order of magnitude is, is, is four times. On the left, uh, total angular error per participant. Uh, on the right, uh, uh, average total distance error per participant um, on the order of d double. So um, uh, at least this is how we can quantify some of the some of the uh, potential benefits that a uh, sort of a more rigorous modern uh, view of some of the tools that computer scientists can offer scientists that they can use to investigate the world. So it's things like this which started to get some excitement at JPL and more, uh, more people have come in and asked for help with some of their uh, computing problems or, or their scientific problems. Uh, and and they're, they're numerous, and there are a number of reasons for this. I'm sure uh, if any of you are familiar or, or have been f following uh, you know, recent work in, in data science or, 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 or read the news, you'll see that, right, that everybody wants to, to point the, the, the arrow like up, right? We're only gonna get more and more data and how, how are we gonna handle problems like that? So these are the kinds of things that scientists at, at JPL struggle with all the time. Um, let me look at uh, another problem, that's robot operations. Uh, this is a model of the athlete robot. It's uh, a hexapod, uh, so you're basically looking at a, a, a robot whose purpose largely is to uh, move things around. Uh, this, it's hard to get some scale here, but this is about uh, 13 and a half feet tall. Uh, each limb has uh, six degrees of freedom. Um, this is probably the single best home court advantage you will ever get, by the way, when you're trying to recruit someone. So <laughs> just, just have this rover just hanging out in the background. You don't even have to talk about it. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, one of the things that, that we have uh, you know, as a future challenge for, for JPL is that this is going to be the next generation of, of space rover, right? So the Curiosity rover that you'll be familiar with, that is going to be in science operations uh, through, well, in active development.